With the video game industry becoming the colossal behemoth it is today, it's inevitable that some things will come into conflict. Whether it be Ubisoft versus releasing fully functioning games, Darkside Phil versus Common Sense, Thank you, you fucking worthless humans, for the views. Or Peter Molyneux versus not talking out of his ass for longer than a femtosecond. We'll all end up at war with something or rather. But every now and then, these differences in opinion are so utterly meaningless, so incredibly stupid, that you wonder why either side is even bickering about it. So this episode we dedicate to these futile fights, these silly spats and these aimless arguments, all of which lead to humorous conclusions that ultimately went nowhere. But hello you, I'm Guru Larry and I welcome you to Fact Hunt, Top 5 Pointless Feuds in Video Games. What happens when you put together two guys responsible for some of the most exhilarating action games of all time? Games that grab you by the pants and clob you around the head with blood, guts, combos and scantily clad women until you don't know who you are anymore. Well, in the case of Tenobu Ninja Gaiden Itagaki and Hideki Devil May Cry Kamiya, you end up with a somewhat pedestrian and often silly spat that would be more at home in the playground than in the arena. It all began in 2008, when Platinum Games' Kamiya said that he wasn't interested in Ninja Gaiden. In the exact same issue of EGM that Kamiya said this in, Itagaki said that he wasn't interested in Kamiya's game Okami, saying that he and his daughter got sick of playing the game and that Kamiya should wake up instead of saying that action games weren't moving forward. That seemed to be it. But Itagaki just couldn't let Kamiya's lack of interest in Ninja Gaiden slide. When Bayonetta rocked E3 in 2009, Itagaki trashed the game by saying it was the same as Kamiya's others and that he was an idiot for making it, while also saying that Kamiya needed laser eye surgery for, um, some reason. Kamiya's only response was to say that only idiots thought that big breasts on women were erotic, a clear reference to Itagaki's Dead or Alive games and also calling Itagaki an idiot, obviously. He also said that he wasn't gay, presumably as a preemptive response to Itagaki potentially calling him a pinch of snuff. For these designers of such high octane games, you would perhaps never expect big egos and insults to get too far away. But jeez, these could be of better quality though, couldn't they? And all because one of them wasn't interested in playing the other one's game. Presumably Cameo's blocked Itagaki on Twitter too, because, you know, that's how he rolls. This feud has stayed quiet for a few years, but who knows what can make it flare up again. Maybe Cameo will give Itagaki a wedgie at the Tokyo Game Show or something like that. From talented video game designers to two of the world's biggest gaming companies. Activision and Electronic Arts both know what it's like to be at the top of the hill in video games, and needless to say, they don't particularly like each other. The fight between two gaming superpowers has mostly taken place behind the scenes, but it's spilled into public views plenty of times, and as ever, it usually consists of mean words. In 2010, Bobby Kotick, Activision's CEO, who's never short of a controversial soundbite, said that EA was struggling and that going to EA was the last resort for game developers. EA didn't exactly take too kindly to this, saying that Kotick's relationship with his talent was well documented in litigation and that Activision's success was based on three franchises. One they had nothing to do with, another that was in steep decline, and another being destroyed by Kotick's own hubris, referring to World of Warcraft, Guitar Hero and Call of Duty respectively. <laughs> of course, there's so much more than that. EA had their own outspoken man at the front, Jeff Brown, their then VP of Public Relations. Jeff always had a response to anyone who badmouthed EA, but particularly Activision, hopefully laughing at comments Kotick made about EA taking the soul out of studios they acquired. 
Their then CEO, John Riccatello, even said that he wished to see Call of Duty rot from the core, when one Activision guy said that all this mudslinging wasn't necessary. Jeff Brown's response was quite simply, yes it is, and also, na 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 na. This big bust up has also ended up in the courtroom too, particularly when the original creators of Call of Duty defected to EA and formed Respawn Entertainment. And there will always be tension between them as the makers of the two biggest shooter franchises around. But both Riccatello and Brown have left EA in recent years for pastures new, and there are less public sound bites these days. But to be honest, considering the quality of these multi-million dollar insults, that's probably for the best. Thanks to the joys of Twitter, we could probably fill up this entire list with spats that have involved Marcus Notch Pearson, aka the creator of Minecraft. A day simply isn't complete without him having something wild to say about somebody else, and we eagerly open up our apps in the morning so we can shake our heads and say that Notch is at it again. Such is the life of a young billionaire these days, it seems. <laughs> But few pointless notch fights compared to this triple threat between himself, Minecraft YouTubers, the Yogs cast, and game reviewing YouTube Brit, Total Biscuit. Once upon a time, all three of them got on, and now none of them do. The heat started in 2011, when Minecon were thrown in order to celebrate the release of version 1.0 of Minecraft. Notch got annoyed because the Yogscast people were doing a lot of swearing on stage and so on, even though there were loads of kids about. Being Notch, he went on Twitter to register his disapproval and ban the Yogscast from any future Minecraft related events. Apparently because one of the Yogscasters saw that Notch had signed a piece of merchandise a kid wanted them to sign and said he'd cross it out and write fuck you over it instead. While official apologies were filed on both sides of this spat, there's not exactly been much healing since. Nearly two years later, Total Biscuit entered the fray with a slight at Notch during one of his WTF is videos. It should, in theory, run on anything unless it was coded by idiots. Which, to be fair, it is Mojang, it is a possibility. Which resulted in another tiff on Twitter, where Total Biscuit came in defense of his friends, the Yogs cast, and Notch maintained that the events that occurred back then were true. It was all somewhat civil, as well as being pointless for coming out so long after the event. Indeed, it would hardly be worthy of mention if the cycle wasn't completed by Total Biscuit and the Yogs cast falling out with each other two years later. After a series of handbag waving exchanges between TB and Simon over riveting topics such as Gamergate and apparently a comic book of some description, ultimately the ties were cut and TB, who helped popularise the Yogg's cast in the first place, was left to tweet out the end of a relationship between master and pupil. Notch presumably had over a hundred other Twitter beefs going on at this point, so he probably didn't notice. And so ends a tale of broken friendship not unlike Bill Paxton's A Simple Plan. Only with way more silly hats. <laughs> For such a big and fairly media shy games company that doesn't like to reveal all that much about what they're doing, Rockstar has certainly been involved in no end of little tiffs with others. While there's no particularly big incident, aside from the tussle with Jack Thompson, they've all piled up. So yeah, they've kind of had feuds with everybody, really. There's all the little stabs they've had at other sandbox games in the Grand Theft Auto series. True Crime got a billboard in San Andreas that wittingly changed its name to True Grime. Missions in both GTA 3 and Vice City, where you had to kill people named Tanner in reference to the Driver series of games. And you also had to do the same to characters named after Marcus Hammond and Frank Carter from the London mobster-tastic The Getaway. There is even a sequence in San Andreas where a character called Mad Dog is seen complaining about a game that's clearly supposed to be Driver 3. Considering how freely Rockstar takes pot shots at other game companies for titles that are similar to GTA, you'd think that Rockstar would be more than happy to take any shots coming their way on the chin. And of course, you'd be wrong. 
When EA released The Simpsons game in 2007, it was filled with references to other games, including a whole mission based on GTA, that apparently had to have a lot of changes made to it because Rockstar, of all people, threatened to sue over it. <laughs> Alanis set would have had a field day with that one, because she does a song called Isn't It Ironic? Yeah. But Rockstar even filed a lawsuit against the BBC over its portrayal in their 2015 drama, The Game Changers, which covered the story of their signature series. As ever, the result of this suit was that more people ended up seeing the Daniel Radcliffe vehicle in order to find out just what had got into Rockstar's points. For a company that has no trouble taking so many shots at others and whose games are loved by so many, it's really quite amazing how willing they are to get involved with such pointless squabbles. My Earth 2 counterpart, Jim Sterling, is another video game person who's had his fair share of scraps, usually with people who make really shit games. They're almost always pointless, simply because said bad game developer would generally have been much better off not responding to our boy at all, instead of making a response video, or taking Jim Sterling to court, or attempting to take Jim Sterling's fans to court. To do one of these is stupid, but Digital Homicide were a bunch of guys who managed to do all three, and then some. It started out just like any other review, when in 2014, Sterling made a video about Digital Homicide's game, The Slaughtering Grounds, a very cheap looking palette swap shooter affair that was quite clearly a load of rubbish. Digital Homicide's founders, James and Robert, the Super Romine brothers, proceeded to get out the big book of what to do next and go through every step one by one. Attempt to take down Sterling's video? Yep. Delete negative reviews on their Steam page? You bet. Make several angry and sweary response videos, including the now popular phrase, I'm effing Jim Sterling, son. You got it. None of this seemed to do the notorious Romines any good in the eyes of the people, but they knew they could go further when it came to destroying whatever reputation they had. They went ahead and decided to file a lawsuit against Jim Sterling for assault, libel and defamation, asking for $15 million over Sterling's repeated bias coverage against Homicide's games. Not only that, they then filed another suit against 100 Steam users for personal injury. And when Valve pulled their games from Steam because of this, they threatened to file another lawsuit against them. Thanks to things such as fair use and what have you, all of the Romine's efforts were in vain, and the lawsuits were completely dismissed in February 2017, proving once again that trying to sue people who negatively critique your game isn't exactly going to turn out well. That is, if you go at someone who has the resources to fight you, that is. This lesson is thankfully something that has been well heeded by other like-minded members of the gaming community, as we all live in a world full of peace and religious fulfil- Oh, wh who am I kidding? Of course it bloody hasn't! Hello you! Thanks ever so much for watching! Be sure to subscribe to be first to see future Fact Hunt episodes. Click on the bell if you already are to make sure you're notified, and be sure to check out my other episodes. And if you want to be super awesome, check out my Patreon! But thanks again for watching, and I'll be seeing you next time. Ta-ra for now!